Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to let the record show that there's perfect attendance in this panel, which, and uh, you should recognize there was a huge ice storm this morning. It was not all that easy to get here in one piece, so I really appreciate all your interest in, and your fortitude in making it. Um, and, I, and I think it, to some degree, belies some of the, we've been hearing some rumors that folks are trying to say the study is kind of driven by one, one narrow industry sector, and it's kind of a gotcha study and uh, creating some friction. And I think really the, the, the level of interest and, and um, resources people are committing to putting things on the record is very important to point out, and we do appreciate all your contributions. And we also would like any guidance that you have for us in, in, in methodology and so forth and making sure that this is the most objective study uh, that we can possibly come up with. Um, the, the issue here is we're trying to look at an entire economy um, and so we necessarily have to narrow it down. Um, but I think we, you know, we all agree that we're not going to make progress with the Indians unless it's, it's a win-win mutual understanding type of agreement. So we have to find, I would like us to spend time uh, at least with some of the sectors where we have a hope of, of making some progress. Uh, Mr. Summers, I wanted to start with you. Uh, I know you, you, you understand this better than I do in terms of how are we organizing trade relations with India at this point? I know we have a lot of different sort of bilateral dialogues that are going on. I guess there's the strategic dialogue with the Secretary of State, and we have trade cases, and there used to be an information technology working group, and then there was another uh, negotiating group that I can't quite remember that USTR was running, but maybe you could kind of describe currently where we are and how these, these issues are being managed by President, Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, there are 36 standing bilateral dialogues underway with India. I think that's perhaps more than um, with any other country. So that, I think, underscores the importance that the administration holds uh, towards its relationship with India. Um, as we now have come into the second administration of the Obama uh, administration, we're beginning to see now which of these uh, dialogues get renewed with the same level of vigor as in the first four years. Um, I would say that right now the momentum clearly appears to be the bilateral investment treaty discussions are now beginning to pick up some steam. They just met the other day. Uh, we want as strong a bilateral investment treaty as been, has been stated here. Uh, the government of India has been inching towards it. And of course, the challenge is that we're now heading into the election season in India. Uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, within a matter of weeks, the Election Commission will announce elections, in which case, uh, pretty much every major discussion will cease until after the elections, which have to conclude by May 31st. The private sector advisory group, the Trade Policy Forum at the USTR, I think is a very substantial dialogue that has still very much a lot of traction. Uh, the U.S.-India strategic dialogue will be taking place probably in September of this year. That's all about homeland security and our defense cooperation and cybersecurity issues. Um, and we are going to begin to um, see very recently, but coming out possibly as early as this coming March, the High Technology Cooperation Group, which is discussions relating to dual-use technologies. And that, that's a very important area because that includes civil nuclear cooperation. So 36 dialogues, five or six really very active, a U.S.-India CEO forum, which is high profile, chaired on the Indian side by Mr. Ratan Tata of the Tata Group, and on the American side by Honey Wells, Mr. Dave Cody, and a number of very prominent CEOs on, on both sides, uh, chaired on the U.S. government side by Mike Froman, and on the Indian side by Montek Singh Alwalia. So the CEO Forum and the U.S. India Strategic Dialogues are perhaps the strongest, most prominent dialogues uh, that we'll be looking forward to this year. And where have been the most successes in the last couple of years in terms of those efforts? You know, I, when, I, when I think of the defense cooperation that we have seen, literally the 10-year arc 
from 250 million to 12 billion dollars in U.S.-India defense cooperation is, I think, unprecedented. Um, that has been extremely successful, and owing to the the U.S.-India strategic dialogue. The next steps in strategic partnership, which was initiated by Mr. Ken Jester back in Department of Commerce in 2002 timeframe, has borne that extraordinary fruit, including the U.S. and the Civil Nuclear Cooperation Initiative. Um, and I think the CEO Forum presents for all of us a, a very real opportunity now to drill down on some of these complex issues, like how do we go about better protecting data, how do we go about uh, getting our intellectual property environment in, in good standing. Uh, how do we cease uh, this slippage that we are concerned about regarding compulsory licenses? Uh, how do we begin to collaborate more effectively on IP? I know that the CEO Forum, the U.S. and the CEO Forum, would look forward to having innovation become a feature of that forum. And then lastly, uh, let us not forget the U.S. Trade Representative's Office the Trade Policy Forum, uh, now uh, headed by Mike Froman. Uh, there is a private sector component called the Private Sector Advisory Group, which informs the two governments from both sides. And that has also proven to be a very agile group to get issues resolved. Um, Mrs. Uh, Schrock. Please. Are there constituencies in India that would, where we could find common cause with, are there regulatory obstacles that are thwarting U.S. business as well as Indian business and in succeeding there? Big ones that you might point to as areas that, that might be right for cooperation because we would have a strong domestic constituency in India for reform? Uh, I think the tax reform is one of those. Uh, because the Indian business also wants a very stable and predictable tax system. So I think that could be one of the first and sort of the low hanging fruits of cooperation between Indian business and the United States businesses. Certainly that could be one. The other, of course, could be the IT sector. Uh, there's already a lot of dialogue on between, as NASCOM pointed out yesterday, and it's uh, testimony that there is already a lot of dialogue between the U.S. companies and the Indian companies. So I think that could be the other area for strategic dialogue between the two companies to begin with. Great. Uh, Ms. Dempsey, did you have any suggestions in that regard in terms of areas that would be really right for mutual cooperation? I, I would hope that India would, for instance, want to engage in, in some of the dialogues that um, Mr. Summers spoke about. The, the Trade Policy Forum, my understanding, has not met since 2010, and that's one of the most direct forums where we could see um, a lot of the dialogue that, that's important. Um, you know, the NAM was um, one of the early callers for a bilateral investment treaty with our BRIC countries, including India back in, I believe it was 2007, and um, we applauded when negotiations were launched in 2008. Then the U.S. took a time out for two and a half years to review our model bilateral investment treaty, and in April 2012 was ready to get back to the table. My understanding is India is in the midst of its own review of a bilateral investment treaty where there have been major concerns raised about whether it would continue down this path at all. And, and yes, our, our teams were meeting, but uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we would like to see, as, as Mr. Simchak said, um, a commitment to the type of high level, open market access, strong property protection type of provisions that uh, are contained in the U.S. model bit and the model bit of countries around the world, including India's with the U.K. Um, and so, you know, if there are those types of things that could move forward, that would be great, but we're not seeing that level of commitment. Uh, we're not seeing that level of detail when it comes to these issues. Uh, if I may just add to that, since the two countries have met as recently as between the 5th and 7th of February this year on the BIT, and I've had a better understanding of the positions of these two countries. I'm, I understand that the next rounds are scheduled for later this year, and India hopes to also get a draft of its own model 
the IT in place by then, and I think there is a commitment to move forward on negotiating on those. What caused the delay? Because I remember the Indian ambassadors before 2012 wanting to get, get down and speaking yeah. on behalf of the government saying we wanted to negotiate on the bit, and then suddenly we had finished our introspective process right. and then it, it I think stalled. India was still reviewing its own version, our own model, bilateral investment treaty, and in the meantime, India did face a lot of problems on the BIT claims from different countries. Um, you know, in respect of telecommunications and several other matters. It was taking a second look at uh, re-reviewing the model BIT treaties. Okay, thank you very much. My time is expired. Thank you, Commissioner King. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I join my, my colleagues in uh, thanking uh, the witnesses today and, and uh, a few days ago for, for coming really such great effort and great ideas. Uh, and. Uh, we try very hard to uh, um, uh, make best use of, of all of the time, and so I'm just going to try to slot in a few uh, questions. These are, uh, the, the first one at least is targeted, but I invite others to follow up in the post-hearing submissions. Uh, so let me just jump right in. Uh, uh, Mr. Simchak, if I could just ask you, uh, for now, if you want to briefly mention, or, or even just later in the post-hearing submission, one of the uh, parts of, uh, one of the components of the ideas you discussed uh, uh, is that uh, there is uh, expected to be a uh, significant growth in U.S. employment in your uh, members' uh, businesses, uh, if they could do more business in India. And I wonder if you could uh, uh, work into that analysis uh, the ways in which uh, outsourcing would feature. So uh, for example, of course, uh, uh, insurance is an industry that depends to a large extent on um, uh, call centers. Uh, on business acumen, uh, information technologies acumen, uh, telephony acumen, and legal acumen, uh, all of which India happens to do reasonably well at, and, and all of which have been um, the topics of the so-called outsourcing debate. and. Uh, I just, it would help us understand better the net impact of the um, relationship you're describing if you could integrate these features in uh, um, to your analysis. And if you want to maybe just briefly give remarks, they're welcome. Uh, if you want to wait, uh, that's fine too. Uh, well, thank you very much, and uh, I, I probably will follow up uh, uh, for the most part, but um, uh, just off the top of my head, I think that uh, I'm sure I, this isn't is an issue that's come up with my members. When they, when they talk about issues in India, they don't say uh, we, we really want um, you know, a liberalized IT or call center uh, environment in India so that we can outsource jobs there. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if a, if a lot of my members do use uh, uh, call centers elsewhere. I, I don't know that. I've never discussed it with them, but, um, but I, I can and will follow up. Um, but, um, you know, I, as far as legal services, I, uh, my guess would be that that's not an area where there's a lot of outsourcing. Uh, I know that there, there has been some movement in the legal field towards outsourcing, like document review and that, that kind of thing, but those would probably be handled, I'm guessing, by law firms that are brought on by the general counsels of the companies. So if there was some outsourcing in that sense, I'm guessing it would come from the law firms that have been hired by the companies. But I'm not aware of any general counsel's offices and insurance companies that outsource themselves. Um, uh, on IT and call centers, maybe I'll follow up if that's, if that's that, all right with you. Absolutely, of course. That's and, and if others, uh, given the inevitable restrictions uh, in time for all of us, really, if anyone on this panel or other panels wants to follow up on any of the dialogue with any of the witnesses, the post-hearing submissions are designed to be open so that uh, um, uh, we really do get a 
very diverse set of perspectives. Uh, let me, if I could, just move to a different, and then invite, invite later, uh, but if I can move to a different topic. Um, it seems as though um, in the discussion about intellectual property, uh, uh, it often comes up most sharply in the context of uh, so-called compulsory licensing. Uh, there is a concern uh, that um, uh, uh, that that a, uh, essentially a large group of consumers uh, will not be able to afford um, a, uh, uh, a given price, what, what I think many of us colloquially think of as a, a list price. And in the hearings the other day, uh, there was discussion about uh, price discrimination and uh, uh, the recognition that in the United States and in India, the example given in that conversation included both the United States and India, Air India, and their online ads for economy airfare, which vary hugely in price, just like in the United States. Um, there was a recognition that, that uh, even a very, very, very selfish-minded uh, uh, property owner, uh, would rationally choose, uh, in the context of a low marginal cost good, to provide that good to a very diverse set of consumers at a very diverse set of prices uh, if she had confidence that she could, A, uh, price discriminate, and B, uh, protect herself from arbitrage. Uh, can any of you either now or in the post-hearing submissions, uh, and any others who would like to, provide evidence of examples of efforts to engage in that kind of crucial public health enhancing effort to provide access to medicine or other uh, um, uh, uh, goods. Uh, uh, that would be uh, done totally within the so-called private market, in other words, by a, a selfish, profit-maximizing property owner uh, uh, without uh, a, a compulsory licensing uh, effort. Uh, have those not been done, in which case maybe the case for compulsory licensing is so much more compelling, uh, or have those in fact been tried but failed, and why have they failed? If there are any remarks anyone would like to provide, uh, please. Yes, Mr. Shaw. Uh, I think on the panel the uh, day before yesterday, I think a statement was made that Gilead in particular had collaborated with 11 Indian companies for manufacture of several drugs and distribution at much lower prices than what they would have done had they imported it from the United States or elsewhere. So I think that has been one of the most successful collaborations between uh, the US company and Indian companies. It's not been one, it's been 11 companies. And I was also, yesterday it was also mentioned that Roche had entered into certain agreements, such agreements uh, for discriminatory pricing uh, for various purposes. Mr. Zwell, yeah. Yes, I, I was going to point to the same example. Um, there, are, there are others as well. Um, and let me just note for the Gilead example that that's all dependent on there being patent, enforceable patent in the first place. You know, with, without enforceable patent, in fact, in this new, you know, we can send more information on this um, to provide actual details, but just to let you know that, that it, it's impossible for companies like Gilead to do that or to do pursue creative strategies of any kind to, without some sort of guarantee that they have control over their product, that they can, that they can license it out, that they have some sort of protection uh, to do that. And so, and of course, I'd also like to point out patient assistant programs I shared my testimony, the medicine's patent pool, there's lots of other mechanisms that are all built around this idea that certain foundational legal certainties are provided by the host nation, in this case, India. And so we'll be happy to follow up with that and, and other potential examples. Ms. Jones? I was just going to add to um, what my colleague just mentioned, but we certainly hear from a number of um, industries in that sector and others about providing 
uh, free of charge, deeply discounted um, medicines, and yet um, still Indian actions, government actions are taken against those patents, undermining that type of legal certainty that the companies are looking for. Josh, may I just add one thing? You had raised the issue of uh, jobs being created, and I would like to put on record that in a recent survey that the CII had done, we find that 17 Indian companies, the top 17 Indian companies who do business in the United States, have created as many as 81,000 jobs in the United States. So there is a both way trade, and it's benefiting the United States as much. Thank you. I, I'm approaching the end of the time, so let me yield. Thank you all very much. And again, I invite, invite others with differing views to, to please submit uh, evidence for the record. That's all very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Summers, I cut you off, but do you want that concluding statement now? Or have, have you already made those points? The, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate that we're all short of time. I, the, the, the main point that I want to make is that we have found that over the 39 years that we've been advocating for deeper U.S. India trade um, as the U.S. India Business Council, the way that we've approached it is, is through really a disciplined engagement and, and that discussion keeping moving forward, uh, putting foremost uh, the, the idea of mutual respect. And so therefore, a little less acrimony. We've heard a lot of acrimony in the last year. I, I would argue that the, the Vodafone tax case that happened a couple of years ago on retroactive taxation really sent up alarms. And, and then, of course, uh, the issue of preferential market access that was so alarming to many of our electronic goods manufacturers. And then these compulsory licensing cases, these underminings of, of intellectual property, we want to see a robust innovation environment in India. And, and our, our, our point is, let us do this through engagement uh, rather than through public acrimony. And, and that was my final point that I wanted to make, sir. Thank you. Um, in that regard, I think of Mr. Superindian yesterday, and there's many some others that, you know, one, they were talking about, as some of you all have talked about, the number of positive things that are happening to look forward to. You got an impression when you're doing the materials that there had been a restrictive period. I don't know whether it started 2007, 2008, 2012, and I don't know to what, to what extent it was influenced by the global recession, but was there a downturn sort of in the government's attitude? And how should we take that into account in this? Uh, was it domestic politics or other things? To yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I, I believe that as we look to the upcoming national elections, which are going to be happening in a matter of weeks, there has clearly been a, a perhaps a shift or a downshift uh, in how do we kind of prepare ourselves and gird ourselves domestically for upcoming national polls. Um, that has, and again, I think the major shift occurred uh, during the Vodafone tax case, which, which happened two years ago, which was a retroactive tax case looking to retrieve taxes from a very large transaction uh, put forward by Vodafone. Uh, up till that point, there was a tremendous bullishness. Uh, you can recall in the 2008 time frame, the U.S. India Civil Nuclear Initiative, I think we were at the pinnacle at that point. Uh, the government of India is now adjusted after its uh, uh, after after the global recession, and I would I would argue that they are now really trying to understand and, and respond to investor concerns. Uh, but the question is, can we get it done quickly enough to revive the GDP to where it needs to be? And and I would argue that here we now find ourselves looking right into the eyes of the upcoming national elections. And so. Uh, a little too late, uh, but we're now, but at least I think the recognition was there, and now we're heading right now back into an area of six, seven, eight percent growth post elections. I was going to say, Delhi's not the only place where elections, and people talk about silly season start. But I'll go. Yeah, sure. Chairman, if I may just sub sub sort of substantiate, uh, supplement what Mr. Summers has said. I think two factors. One is the upcoming elections, which are going to happen about eight to ten weeks from now. And the other one, there were state level elections towards the end of last year, which also sort of slowed down some of the decision making. But I think all through the years, the intention of the government of India has always been very clear of making progress of what we call the second tier, second level of reforms. 
expanding the limits for FDI caps wherever they existed. One of those things, for example, would be the telecommunications sector, where from 74% they made it 100%. And I understand that very few countries in the world today actually allow 100% foreign direct investment in telecommunications. So I think there have been steps that have been taken even during this period which have sort of gone unnoticed. Though the continuous effort of the government has always been to sort of improve uh, the, and relax the caps that have existed. And Paula, if I could just supplement. There's one thing in, in watching this relationship for the last 22 years from Narasim Rao, the Prime Minister, who really opened the economy in 1991 to where we are today, we've seen seven different Prime Ministers or seven different administrations. No matter what political party comes, the genie is out of the bottle, reforms are on track. Every government over that 22-year period has continued to open the economy and embrace the global economy. And we at CII would believe that that would continue to be respected of which government comes to power in the next election. Perhaps a slightly different perspective um, from where we sit at the National Association of Manufacturers. The most recent downturn we, in, in sort of the restrictiveness of India's policies, we really saw it towards the end of 2011 with their national manufacturing policy that's cited, cited in my written testimony, although there had been long-standing issues before that. I, I would also you know, like to call to your attention, many of you have worked directly on, on some of the international negotiations out there. You know, we and, and others had, and the United States government had tried to work with India on the Doha development agenda round to you know, promote liberalization broadly. It was something my organization would love to see come back one day because that is the greatest power to, to lift all boats. Um, but India's role in that was not a positive one and, and really uh, moved to a place where they were not willing to even open up their economy as much as China did when China joined the WTO in 2001. Uh, we saw it just this past uh, winter with the trade facilitation talks in, in the WTO. Again, it should have been an easy deal to cut red tape at borders, to lower corruption. Uh, groups like the World Economic Forum cited the huge benefits that were going to come of that, particularly in the developing to developing world where this was. And, and India um, you know, took a very strong stance and wanted to um, gain concessions uh, in the food area, concessions that uh, I think a lot of folks don't believe will actually improve food security but um, make it much more difficult because they're all about restricting that economy. And so we, we continue to want to see uh, the Indian government move forward with the type of broader trade liberalization that's out there, but I think we've been disappointed again and again by that. And then on top of that, the types of actions across these types of industries, the others you heard yesterday and we'll hear later today, is of great concern. And the issue is not to raise acrimony, but the issue is to actually resolve differences not take a few actions, put something on hold, who knows when PMA might come back again, um, but to actually resolve these issues in, in a long-standing, committed way. Thank you. Oh, Mr. C. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just add, you know, as, a, as someone whose personal philosophy is one of uh, supporting free enterprise, I'm always happy to hear that FDI caps have been eliminated or raised in other sectors, even in other financial services sectors. I would just point out that we're still sitting at 26% as insurance companies, uh, uh, and, and despite anticipation that that cap would be raised over time when it went to 26% in, uh, in, in 1999, we're, we're still at 26%. Is there any domestic political interests that are driving why insurance, the, the cap on insurance is so much lower? I'm, would never claim, I would never claim to be a, an expert in, in domestic politics of India. Um, but my understanding is that it's more difficult to raise the insurance cap because it has to be done legislatively as opposed to caps in other sectors which can be done by fiat of the government. Um, I know that there's a lot of acrimony between uh, the, the, the Congress-led coalition government now and the, uh, the BJP opposition party and that that is the, the main barrier uh, uh, to raising the cap. Um, the, the Congress-led government, coalition government, supports raising the cap, which, which, is, which is great, um, which we are very appreciative of. Um, but because of the 
domestic political tensions between the two parties uh, it has not been raised. Uh, just the irony of that is that it was the BJP government earlier, the NDA-led government, that wanted to raise it to 49%. The communist government